Uh, very important, but very quick too. It's just a little brain refresher in regards to all the dental emergencies that walk into our offices on a daily basis. Fatma, are you controlling the screen or is it me? Sorry, guys, just a little technical difficulties. It's you. Okay, is it me? All right. All right, there we go. Okay, so the first thing is we have to diagnose why the patient has come in from the first get-go. The first thing is dental pain. You have to take the history of onset of pain and assess the etiology. It can either be a dental source, which is related to the oral region that we mainly treat, or it could be myof myofascial inflammation, maxillary sinusitis, TMJ, migraines, headaches, ears, ENT. So we kind of have to get the etiology when it started and what the history of the pain onset was. To begin with, we have the dental caries progression. It's a bacterial disease of the tooth or multiple teeth that affects and leads to demineralization of the tooth enamel and dentine by the acid production that we have in our mouths. It comes as an either an opaque area, and that's I find that a lot of those ones are typically missed. So please do watch out for them. They do have a gray undertone or brownish discoloration. They are generally asymptomatic. They can sometimes, though, come with a little bit of sensitivity to cold or sometimes a little bit of sensitivity to sweet. They lead to multiple pulpal inflammation. So that's what we're going to be discussing afterwards. So first thing is after the affected caries come into place, we have reversible pulpitis. The symptoms that come with that are pain to hot, cold, or sweet stimuli, and it usually resolves on its own. The treatment of method for that type of reversible pulpitis is removal of decay and a permanent restoration and seeing how the patient feels afterwards in two weeks. Irreversible pulpitis, so as the cavity impinges on the nerve, the irreversible pulpitis is created. It's a localized bacterial infection causing severe inflammation in the pulpal tissue of the tooth. The pain is more severe and spontaneous, persistent, and poorly localized. The treatment is the immediate removal of the inflamed nerve tissue and the completion of root canal treatment. So you can either do a pulpectomy or you could complete the root canal treatment or obviously an extraction. You have to give also the treatment method of no treatment, but you do have to let the patient know the consequences of that no treatment. You're going to know the sequel of it after. So if the appointment is to be delayed, you have to give a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory pain medication or acetaminophen or combined with a mild form of opioid. And you have to have to notify the patient of the importance of the completion of treatment. After reversible pulpitis, the nerve will begin to degenerate and die. The pain will become much more severe and much more spontaneous. It's persistent. And unlike irreversible pulpitis, it's localized to that tooth. So when the patient comes with irreversible pulpitis, a lot of the time we just see patients kind of pointing towards the side or they don't even know if it's top or bottom. And that's why an, uh, an urgent emergency test is going to be done. You can do it via pul uh, palpation percussion and the cold test and that will give you which one is more affected we have to keep in mind that sometimes with irreversible pulpitis we will have a little bit of pain that can go to into another area so it's going to be more like referred pain now for necrotic nerve it is sensitive to percussion you can find regional lymph node involvement and the treatment of choice is obviously root canal therapy or extraction or no treatment but again you have to inform the patient the benefits of the root canal therapy the disadvantages of the extraction or even no treatment and what can, that can cause
so after that an apical abscess can form and as you see on the picture right here this is usually most of the time time what it will look like apically localized bacterial infection that causes on the palatal or buccal it will be fluctuant and it will be somewhere around the affected tooth with or without a fistula so it's either draining or non-draining and then we also know to use the gutta percha to drain uh, you can also trace it with the gutta percha and do an x-ray you will have pain erythema and swelling the choice of treatment is incision and drainage in the in the fluctuant swelling area and it will cause immediate relief of pressure and pain for the patient now if an apical abscess is not treated after a very long time it will cause what we call cellulitis now there are different types of cellulitis we're going to speak in regards to that it could either be diffuse so cellulitis generally it's going to be diffused in a very tense swelling on the adjacent adjacent soft tissue the patient's going to have pain, arrhythmia, swelling, lymph node involvement, and fever. Not all of them have to be present, but, but you will definitely have some of these symptoms present. The swelling can be deep into the facial spaces and can spread into deeper fascias of the head and neck, causing life-threatening complications. In the maxillary region, we care about the cavernous sinus thrombosis, the periorbital swelling that can lead to loss of vision, and it can have CNS involvement or without it. The mandibular cellulitis into deep fascias can lead to airway obstruction, and this is where we really have to inform the patient what the cause, so if they don't perform the root canal, the extraction, if they tend to wait, then this can happen to them. So the treatment of choice for cellulitis, first you have to do the examination and determine whether cellulitis is localized or is it spread regionally. So localized cellulitis is going to, we're going to treat it with oral antibiotics such as penicillin, amoxicillin or amoxiclav, um, 500 milligrams TID, just the normal one that we prescribe, or 20 to 40 milligrams or up to 50 milligrams per kilogram in children. Allergies to penicillin should be treated with 300 milligrams of clindamycin QID for seven days. You also have to give them pain medications such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or opioids and acetaminophen. The, the definitive treatment after the cellulitis or the infection is it kind of subsides after giving the antibiotic is definitely root canal therapy or extraction of the affected tooth. So this is what a regional cellulitis will look like. It's going to be deep in the head and neck. You are going to see, you're going to observe. So if it's in the maxillary, you're going to see that the eye, the nose area, it's really affected and that can cause loss of vision. If it's in the mandibular, you're going to find a more pronouns. You're going to, you're barely going to feel the floor of the mandible and you're also going to find it more in the neck area so please do be careful when you are examining always check the floor of the mouth that it's not elevated um, and that there is no hard swelling and so if we have regional cellulitis that does affect the deep areas we are going to refer the patient to the hospital. They are going to see a disease and infection consultant. They are going to be able to get a CT imaging scan in the hospital and incision, incision and drainage of the abscess area is obviously um, expected with the doctors. Broad spectrum IV antibiotics is also a must. Removal of the causing tooth or root canal therapy after the swelling has subsided is highly recommended. Another common thing that we see, and we may get mixed up between a periapical abscess or just a general abscess on the buccal or palatal area, in regards is also a, per a periodontal origin. So we can also have a periodontal, patients coming in with periodontal pain, and they will think that it's affecting an actual tooth. They'll sometimes say that we have a bump. So what that means is that they have the destruction in the periodontal ligament and the supporting alveolar bone. They can either present with chronic periodontitis where they tell you, all my teeth are hurting. And that's where you have to refer them to get deep cleanings, or there could be a Fourier object stuck like a popcorn kernel or calculus in the gums, and they're going to have pain, arrhythmia, swelling, and mobility of teeth. The treatment will be the debridement of the affected area, and in some cases, antibacterial treatment is also recommended. Now, what's really important is that we do the palpation percussion sensitivity test and the x-rays. 
your story should tell the complete story. So when you do the palpation, you're going to feel a tenderness and swelling and fluctuation. And there's also hardness in the underlying tissue. The percussion test will show that the tooth, where that bump is, is going to be positive to percussion. It's going to be tender. And then to determine the sensitivity test, you have to do the endoise to see if the tooth is vital or not. And also on the x-rays, it should be able to show somewhat bone loss, and that will indicate a periodontal abscess. The other type of emergency treatment that we do find very common in our offices is pericoronitis. So when the wisdom tooth partially erupts, there's a flap of tissue distal to it that food impaction happens and then it does get inflamed and very swollen. So inflamed gums over a partially erupted tooth, you're gonna find the pain is complaining of pain on biting, arrhythmia, swelling. They can have cellulitis, trismus, lymph node involvement. All of those are an indication and we should look out for it. If it is a first time complication that happens to the patient, you can always recommend salt and water rinses, but you kind of have to use your clinical judgment and kind of examine the area very, very closely and see if that is going to help. If this is an ongoing situation, then they can either have the that area, that little flap removed, or if it's partially impacted and you don't see that the tooth is going to come out straight, there's decay around the tooth that's severely inflamed or with any of the following symptoms, then you can refer the patient for an extraction. Um, usually a lot of localized cases that don't respond to the mechanical therapy, they're going to spread into a cellulitis situation and that can be treated obviously with appropriate medications, but also you have to remove the cause. So one of also the main things that we see is tooth fractures due to dental trauma. Dental trauma is probably one of the most common treatments that I have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's mainly under, uh, for, it's mainly in children. So it is children 13 and under that are particularly affected. It can affect the primary teeth and the permanent teeth. And how we treat the permanent teeth is different than the permanent teeth. The primary teeth is different than the permanent teeth. So you have different types of traumas. The first one is the tooth fractures. It could either be a vertical root fracture or a horizontal root fracture. Now for vertical root fractures, unfortunately, those do have to go to extractions but you have to be very sure of it in the way you clinically diagnose it. And horizontal root fractures, it depends on the area, if it's near the gum or if it's more towards the periapical of the root. Tooth luxation, it could either be lateral movement or extrusive movement. So it's a looser displaced tooth due to a direct blow to the affected area. The child or the person could fall, they could take a punch, I had a kid the other day that came in and apparently he bit down on his, to uh, on his toy and that also caused extrusive luxation. So you always have to get the history of why it happened in the first place and when it happened so you're able to help the patient. Tooth avulsion presents as a clinically missing tooth due to trauma and tooth intrusion, it's when the tooth is actually displaced into the alveolar bone vertically. So again, like we said, dental trauma, you have to know what the mechanism of injury is. How did it happen and when did it happen? You have to do a proper soft tissue examination. Make sure you're examining the lips, the gums, the mucosa, the nose, all of the surrounding areas to see if there's any deep lacerations where the child or the person might need stitching. The tooth mobility, you have to assess the mobility. It will also affect the prognosis and the sequel of the treatment. Displacement or fractures, you have to observe the fractures very, very carefully because sometimes it's not through and through. What it means is that you're not going to see a full radiolucent line on the x-ray. So you have to kind of really examine the x-ray and maybe get even two types of angles, that sometimes helps me. Disturbances in bite or other signs of alveolar fractures also have to be examined. You at least need one dental radiograph for the diagnosis. If a child comes 
you have to try to take at least that one dental radiograph to really know what is going on because it could be much more complicated more than what you see um, in the patient's mouth. Now, the long-term sequel that could happen in an event of dental trauma when a child hits the tooth, you know, an elder person hits the tooth, it could lead to pulp death, root resorption. Um, it could affect the permanent tooth successors. You have displacement or developmental defects in them. Tooth fractures can involve either the crown alone, the root alone, or the crown and root and with or without pulpal exposure. So you also have to examine for that. Fractures that are limited to the enamel and dentine can be restored immediately in the same appointment to decrease any sensitivity that can happen to the patient as long as the pulp, the nerve, is not visible. Fractures exposing the pulp require root canal therapy or extraction, and avulsed tooth fragments should be kept hydrated as they could be possibly reattached. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. So, the trauma type, and I think these two tables are probably the whole concept of this session. Um, I think everybody should have a picture of it just in case we do tend to forget sometimes or, you know, we're just in a little bit of a rut. We have to provide the appropriate treatment. So for the trauma type for teeth, in enamel and dentine fracture, for primary teeth, you can always do restorative treatment. For permanent teeth, you also do restorative treatment as long as there is no pulpal exposure. If there is pulpal exposure in primary teeth, you have to assess if it's going to affect the permanent successors. If it is, then and you're not able to per perform a pulpotomy, then you have to extract the tooth because it's only going to add bacteria and pain to the patient. And then for permanent teeth, you have to do root canal therapy if there is pulpal exposure. Now, lateral or extrusive luxation, they're in primary teeth. If they are very, very mobile, there is a danger to the airway of the patient or there's an interference with normal occlusion and the patient's going to be in pain then you have to do the extraction to prevent any of those complications. In permanent teeth, you have to reposition the tooth if you're able to and splint it. And it may or may not need root canal therapy and obviously long-term follow-up so you can see the prognosis. At any time, if we reposition and splint and initially we don't see that we need the root canal therapy and the patient later develops permanent tooth discoloration or periapical abscess, anywhere around those lines, we have to keep on monitoring the patient so we can perform the root canal therapy. They are done at intervals. Intrusive luxation, we are going to monitor. So when the tooth is intrusively luxated, so it's embedded into the alveolar bone, what will happen is for the primary teeth, we're going to have to monitor for the re-eruption. And then for the permanent teeth, we're going to monitor to promote the re-eruption. So we have to monitor and see if it's going to re-erupt on its own or does it need surgical exposure or orthodontic extrusion. And it depends on the case afterwards, like I said, monitor, and then you can decide if you need root canal therapy. So avulge teeth and primary teeth, if the tooth, if the patient comes and there's a baby tooth in their hand, do not re-implant it. You just have to make sure that there is no lacerations on the patient's, in the patient's mouth, and then you, the permanent successor is going to come out eventually. For permanent teeth, it's a little bit different. For permanent teeth, it's very time dependent. So I believe, if I remember it's about 60 minutes. Obviously, get the patient to still keep it after the 60 minutes. The prognosis rate is going to go much less, but there is still a chance that you can try. And you never rub the root surface. So the root surface, when the tooth is evolved, it's going to have periodontal ligament remnants on it. If you rub it, you're destroying any chance of it succeeding in the reimplantation. Best reimplantation is on scene. So if you have a patient call and say that, you know, my child's tooth fell, my tooth fell, it's in my hand, just say, try to place it in the correct way. Um, they can wash it with cold tap water, but notify them that they are not allowed to rub the root surface. If reimplantation on scene cannot be done, they have to have it in a transport in an appropriate tr transportation medium, such as milk or saliva, and they have to come to the office right away. You can do a saline rinse in the office and then reimplant it, splinting and antibiotic prophylaxis, obviously, and monitor it. 
So we're going to just revise. I believe that this is the last slide. We're going to just revise the most common dental emergencies again, their possible complications and their treatment. So for reversible pul pulpitis, we said that they're going to come with pain with hot or cold or sweet stimuli, and then they can perform, they can uh, they can turn into a periapical abscess or cellulitis, and what you need to do is a filling. After that will come irreversible pulpitis, and it's spontaneous and poorly localized in pain. The patient cannot tell where it is, and you are going to do either root canal treatment or extraction. A periapical abscess, it's going to be more confined to the tooth. You're going to find a radial lucency at the periapex or even sometimes at the bifurcation an area if it's located buccally and what that can cause is actually cellulitis in the future you have to do an incision and drainage and root canal therapy or extraction for cellulitis it's going to be a soft diffused tissue bacterial infection it's going to have pain arrhythmia swelling a patient is going to come up with a nearly blown up head or neck or face we've all seen it and you're going to be giving antibiotics root canal or extraction but this is after you assess if it's localized or is, or is there regional spread. If there's a regional spread in the fascias of the face, then you are going to refer to the hospital. If not, then you can go ahead, do incision drainage, and then root canal therapy. For pericoronitis, it's inflamed gum over the partially erupted tooth, mainly wisdom teeth. It can cause a lot of pain, more than we can actually expect in the patient. So do take it seriously and try to do irrigation, antibiotics, if cellulitis is present, or uh, have them perform the extraction if it's needed. So it depends really on what you see on the x-ray in the patient's uh, condition. For tooth fractures, tooth luxation, tooth avulsion, you're mostly going to get pulpitis or the patient for luxation is going to have an aspiration or pulpitis and then for tooth avulsion a missing tooth they can either have ankylosis or resorption you just have to do the splinting root canal therapy or extraction for tooth luxation depending on whether it's primary or permanent for tooth fractures you have to assess how deep the fracture is and then you can either do fillings with or without root canal therapy or extraction and then for tooth avulsion it's reimplantation and splinting does anybody have any questions No questions? And doctor, we can have the questions towards the end. Are you nearly okay. done? Or? Yeah, yes. So the article that I was given is very straightforward. It's It was very, very minor. That's why we wanted to originally, I don't know if Fatma told you to combine two in one. No, that's actually, to... it's a huge topic. I was, Please? if you're done, if you're done, yeah. guys, if anybody has a question, they can put it in the chat. And then uh, we will read it, right? And uh, for you and we can answer it. If not, we will pick on some of you and, uh, you know, and uh, and do that ourselves, right? You better ask the question rather than be asked questions. Don't forget uh, that they have a little uh, 10 question quiz or, you know. Yeah, you have to, you have to answer some no. question in order for you to get the points by the college. Uh, it was a very nicely done, doctor. And it's a very important topic, usually very much neglected by us. As we start to look at these things are to be basic, but we do um, forget that it's very important. One point I would like to add is just that uh, yeah. try to have a thorough understanding of the anatomy of the uh, head and neck region, because, uh, you know, remember that there is something called the mylohyoid remember where the insurgence is, remember where it is ending. Remember that mylohyoid serves as an anatomical barrier to prevent up the spread of the infections. So in certain areas, it can be dangerous. And if the infection uh, can lead uh, to a very serious uh, consequences, uh, right? Remember where are your dangerous spaces. Uh, remember as well to link these type of infection with the medical status of the patient. Remember that the more immunocompromised patient that you have, the worse that it will be. 
remember as well, there is something called safeguarding, meaning is that be a little bit suspicious when a child shows up into your chair and there are certain injuries that they don't have to. Still, nevertheless, understand that children could be hyperactive. Look at the skeletal pattern. Look at the top of the injury. Look at the frequency of that. It's okay for a child, uh, you know, to fall in once. But is it normal for a child to fall in every week? Uh, even if it is unintentional, parents have a duty to protect their children. They always be afraid to raise an alarm if uh, you suspect something. As well, uh, I want you to um, uh, start to uh, understand and appreciate what is the meaning of antibiotics or why they are used understand what systematic involvement, the word of systematic involvement mean, and, um, you know, atrismus, tachycardia, fever, chills, lymph nodes enlargements, difficulty swallowing, difficulty breathing, hoarseness. Uh, understand when you should treat and where you shouldn't treat, and you should refer up to the hospital, the emergency room. Remember, there has been cases of death has resulted from odontogenic infections. So it is something that you really should be very much concerned about. People can get seriously sick. Uh, if you are healthy, not everybody is healthy, right? Sepsis can kill. Remember that as well. So the good thing about it is that to look at every case is like as a potential, uh, you know, damage to the health of the human that is sitting on your chair. So the case is that you should be worrying for that patient not worrying from lawsuits, but rather worry for the patient and worry for the outcome that might happen if you don't treat that patient very fast. Uh, so make sure this is uh, going to be the case. You have no idea how fast certain uh, infections can spread. They can spread within the, the thing within hours, um, not days. So please uh, do that. Understand that an abscess means accumulation of pus that is surrounded by a thick fibrous um, envelope uh, that will prevent up the penetration of the local, uh, of, the, uh, of the antibiotic factors. Remember that the treatment of choice when you do this is not gonna be just antibiotic, but rather incision and drainage. Remember that whenever you suspect that there is pus, you should do an incision and drainage. Be aware, be familiar with the uh, dental, American dental traumatology guidelines with regards to uh, treatment of trauma. I know for a fact that few of you have worked very closely with trauma cases and they always make me very proud with the income. And I always say that we should every year have a trauma lecture uh, meeting because it is very common, more common than you think. So those things that Dr. Wea has mentioned, I would love maybe to impinge on one of you in the later few weeks to yes, present yeah. it again. Yeah, yeah, we also did, Dr. Rabin and I, we also did one, I believe, last year or this year. Yeah, I know. On YouTube, so th that one yeah. was a really good lecture. Not uh, because yeah. because it was yeah. really, really It was a very nice day, but Especially the whole idea that uh, Dr. Rabin is that uh, for yeah. people to engage, so whenever they present, they read and they share their knowledge and they look at it from another perspective as well. So uh, it's actually uh, it's actually something that every week should be presented, every year should be presented, I believe, should be presented alive. Anyways, any questions right now? If not, me and Dr. Wiyam are going to impinge on you after the 10 questions. Are we going to ask you? Correct, Dr. Wiyam? Yeah, of course. I think you should take the lead. <laughs> oh, no, 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 we're not. Okay, so you want to start doing up the 10 questions? For yeah, the, uh, I'll pause them. She's going to pull up the poll just because. Right. So if I see this. a lot of new guys uh, here. Please don't be intimidated. Is We don't know who did what. Yes, so this your is name, your name, yeah, your name, yeah, your name is not going to appear whether you have a right or wrong answer. It's all about participation and it doesn't mean anything. It just ticking up the boxes so that, you know, we can maintain our status as provider of continuing education points with the college. So please join and do it. Even if you have done it wrong, nobody's after you. It's not going to affect anything. Oh, we wouldn't know if you did right or wrong. We will just know that there was a right or wrong answer, but we wouldn't know who did it. Okay. 
So I, I encourage everybody to participate. You can go ahead, take a lead, doctor. Okay, so the questions, can everybody see the questions? If you guys can start answering them, we'll give you a few minutes in peace and quiet so you guys can read. I'm not quite sure that I can see it myself, by the way. So Fatma has shared it. It is, it has popped up on my page. I can't answer them. I am the host. Guys, but uh, guys there, can you Fatma. see it? You guys, can, can you see the answer in the chat box? Uh, yes, we can see it. I can see it. Okay. Okay. All perfect. Right. Sure coming okay. In. Perfect. perfect. Whoever cannot see it, please say. How are we doing with the poll, doctor? How many percentage, what's the percentage? So we have 22 people answering. We have six more, we're waiting on six. So we'll just wait a little bit more. All right, wonderful, thank you. Thank you. 
Dear Fatima, please, I missed the questions. Can you open them for me, please, again? Sorry, um, those polo questions, they should be there on your screen. Um, you have to, sometimes you have to swipe or like swipe on your, are you using your phone or your computer? If you're using your phone, you sometimes you have to swipe uh, to the next screen. You have to choose uh, the little uh, dots. In the yeah, if you, if you swipe on your, if you are using your phone, look on the tab that says more, more press on yeah. it. Press on it and press pause. There you go, thank you. You know, guys, I'm very excited to see that Dr. Usman from New York is actually with us. Makes me very happy, Dr. Usman, to see you. Has anyone still not answered the questions? Because 25 to 28 have answered the poll questions. I think the rest is me, you, and Fatima. Yeah, I think we can just start answering the questions right now. It's fine. So let's go through the polls. Can everybody see the results on it? Should I start reading? Dr. Hassan, can you see it? Yes, yes, I can. All right. So dental trauma is most common in children under the age of 13. Is it true or false? That is true. That is the most common age that we see dental trauma in. Again, like Dr. Hassan said, please watch out for multiple uh, injuries and, and just take care in the sense of trying to ask the child, um, see if there's any other visible signs that would indicate otherwise. The second question is the primary treatment of a fluctuant localized dental abscess, incision and drainage, incision drainage and root canal therapy is the primary answer. Antibiotics would not do anything for you if you don't relieve the patient of the localized abscess. That is the main treatment for it. In an ideal situation with lateral tooth luxation, the treatment of choice is splinting with or without root canal therapy, depending on the situation. Um, lateral luxa tooth luxation is when the, when the person gets hit, they have a trauma, and the tooth will move somewhat laterally, either buccal, lingually, or mesiodistally. You're going to find that it's sometimes away from the occlusion, as long as it's not interfering with if anything, such as the bite, then you can go ahead and splint with or without root canal therapy. Reimplantation A is the wrong answer because that would be for avulsion. So you have to kind of know what, what lateral tooth luxation means and what avulsion means so you can know the right answer. Extraction of a lateral tooth luxation, no. 
just because the tooth is displaced a little bit does not mean you need an extraction. You'd have more serious signs such as complete fracture. It's going to impinge on the permanent successor. That's when you can go for a primary tooth extraction. But other than or airway uh, compromise, otherwise, no, keep the tooth, splint it with or without root canal therapy, depending on the situation. Question number four, reversible pulpitis presents with pain on hot or cold stimuli that is true spontaneous and poorly localized you can have it in some instances but most of the time they will be able to tell you that that is the tooth that it actually hurts them and it has to have a stimuli it has to have something that will cause them pain such as hot cold or sweet and the treatment of choice for that one is a filling you have to place a permanent filling on it Question number five, dental abscess sequel, if not treated, includes localized pain and swelling that can be caused. So what the question is asking is if, if a dental abscess is not treated, what can it cause? It's all of the above. The patient can have cellulitis, localized pain, swelling, or it, it depends. They can have fever. They can have chismus. It really depends on what stage the nerve is in, whether it's irreversible, necrotic, there's a periapical abscess. So it, the, it practically, it's asking if you give the patient a no treatment option, what are the consequences that you're going to tell them that can occur? And it's all of the above. Question number six, primary avulsed teeth must be not reimplanted is the correct answer. So for primary teeth, you cannot reimplant them. If it were permanent teeth, the answer would be A. Debride with saline reimplant, splint obviously, and then monitor. Question number seven, intrusive luxation of a permanent tooth initially requires sorry intrusive luxation of a permanent tooth initially requires so the first thing you have to do when a tooth is embedded in the alveolar bone below the occlusal plane you're going to monitor initially it is a permanent tooth so you can't do extraction and reimplant it. You can't do surgical exposure of the tooth. That's for that's for intrusive intrusive teeth below. Uh, so it's completely embedded. So you have to first monitor it, and then you can see if you need to surgically expose it or do orthodontic involvement. Primary teeth with lateral or exclusive luxation may endanger the patient's airway and therefore require extraction. The answer is true. So for primary teeth, if a child is not as aware as a elder person, so you have to extract the teeth. If you find that it's just hanging on barely by a thread, it can go in the patient's airway. The treatment of choice for regional cellulitis of the fascias of the head and neck so the first thing you have to do is immediate hospital referral. You cannot incision and drain something that's deep in the fascia. It needs a clinical setting and they have to place them in IV antibiotics. Again, do read the two. I can pull them back up for you guys. You guys can have the treatment for each one of them. I'll, I'll pull up the... Um, the slides with the treatments. So the answer for a regional cellulitis in the deep fascias, you, you should not be incisioning and draining inside the clinic. You do have to immediately refer to a hospital. Patients attending the office with an irreversible pulpitis diagnosis should be given the following treatment options, except, so, for a patient with irreversible pulpitis, it's except. It's not what you would be giving them. You, you, you should not be giving them antibiotics at an irreversible pulpitis stage. It, it literally doesn't do anything. The patient has pain from the nerve, the cavity, the bacteria is encroaching on the pulp. You should not be giving antibiotics. You can give them the treatment and no treatment, but you tell them the consequences. You can tell them that they can have an extraction but then you also have to inform them the disadvantages of extraction, how much it is it costs to replace the tooth. You have to let them know what comes in the future, not just in the moment, just so they can make a more conscious decision. And root canal therapy is also correct. We usually don't give antibiotics. Okay, we're all done. Does anybody have any question?
Please, guys, if you have questions, put it in the chat. Dr. Sally, do you have any questions at all? Um, to the audience? Yeah, pick, pick on one person. No, I won't pick. I, I, I don't want them <laughs> to hate me. <laughs> it's all right. You tell me the name, I'll pick on them. They already hate me anyways, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um... Maybe we can address it to Dr. Wiam, right? Might as well. Mm -hmm. Why me? Why me? Because <laughs> you're the expert now. Yeah, I, right. <laughs> I gave my lecture. All right, go ahead, you guys. Um, I think, so when a patient first comes in for an emergency, mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what tests do you have uh, in hand or what type of x-rays are you going to order when are you going to order a pen when are you going to order a bite wing when is it a pa when do you need uh, pulp testing percussion perio so, probing so it kind of depends on because there is there is the, like there are times when it's a must for you for example to do perio probing so it, honestly, Dr. Sally, it really depends on the situation, what the chief complaint of the patient is. So it, initially, just generally, what will happen is when the patient comes in, I'll review completely the medical history. I'll make sure a hundred times that they have no allergies. And patients tend to also think that medical history means, you know, do I, God forbid, have cancer? No, I don't. I'm fully healthy. But they'll have blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, they're allergic to penicillin, I always have to reconfirm that. After that, I'll take what's bothering them and if they can actually localize it. So if they tell me I have constant spontaneous pain, I'll take the history. How long has it started for? Have you had this pain before? Um, I'll go in onto tapping. It's, I'll try to locate the tooth. So percussion, right? Sometimes the patient will come with such diffuse pain that they actually cannot locate it you have to actually do the percussion to kind of at least narrow it down sometimes it'll be two teeth sometimes all the teeth are affected so we i find that a lot of patients will come for example if they have a periodontal issue and they'll be like i have pain everywhere and it's you have to kind of narrow it down you have to look at their oral hygiene health right so if they're coming with a periodontal condition then i obviously have to do periodontal probing if they're if i suspect a periodontal abscess i'll do the periodontal probing um if i suspect a j so if i see a j-shaped radiolucency on the x-ray or i suspect a vertical root fracture i do the periodontal probing i also try to kind of you know uh, use the explorer to kind of see underneath the gum sometimes if it's a little bit close to the gum line it'll show the fracture line um if they're they have pain on hot and cold then obviously i have to do the cold test to see which tooth it is and i i do on the opposite side on the same side um so contralateral just so they can kind of get an idea of what's normal what's not generally for all my patients that come in if it's a wisdom tooth and it's the bottom i will most likely be doing if it's anywhere in the that area i will be doing a panoramic x-ray or even if it's a top uh an upper wisdom tooth if it's anywhere after that like anything from the anterior obviously pas anything in you know premolar posterior i will do a bite wing and a pa i personally find that i can't complete my exam with only a pa because i if the angulation is somewhat off and your your cavity seems to be away from the nerve or on the nerve you can't get a proper diagnosis with just a pa you need a bite wing does that answer the it, it's, lovely it, that that it's last really is what dependent. i was probing for so the wow. bite wing wow. uh, a wow. few of us wow. miss wow. the bite wings on emergencies especially when it's a posterior they they go for um pas and they hope that they would you know locate the tooth and that's it but when it's an irreversible case 
And when there is referred pain and the patient points to four, six, that has a large cavity or a large filling, when there is also another tooth um, yeah. uh, on the opposing arch that also has uh, an ongoing major issue, be it a deep cavity or a deep filling, uh, the bite wing does help locate the tooth when, in cases of referred pain. It helps, uh, like you said, the angulation, um, knowing where the cavity or the filling, sometimes it's a deep filling that turned into a, an irreversible pulpitis. Um, the extent of it, um, how restorable that tooth is, because again, you cannot assess restorability just based on a, on a PA. Um, so it's usually uh, required. Now, I, I would say I, any emergency, so. all my, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but any emergency, my assistants always know bite wing and a PA if it's anywhere between the four and the seven. Bite yeah. wing and PA. If I suspect that the patient's coming for anything such as rever anything within the wisdom tooth and it's just like a filling, a cavity, we'll try to also get the bite wing or the PA. I know it's going to be hard, but there are ways where you can have your patient actually bite down and do it, right? Um, you just have to have an experienced assistant to do it. I simply cannot assess cavities or anything. And what I also find very common is the angulation of the bite wing. Guys, the, the definition of a bite wing is you have to see the mesial and distal you, you have to see it through and through to kind of actually see, because if there's an overlap, you will miss cavities. This is not even just in emergencies, but this is just regular hygiene checks and everything. So for example, if the hygienist is not doing appropriate bite wings, ask for another bite wing because it's going to come back and, and the patient's going to be like, but I was here six months ago. I was here three months ago. Why did you guys not catch this, right? Did mm -hmm. they, we do get questions like that. Did, did the cavity just start? So how is it that big, right? You have to make sure. And also what I find is the anterior of the 1424, like the, the first premolars, the mesial, sorry, the mesial of the first premolars are always missed 80% of the time in x-rays. So make sure the two bite wings are done. It's okay to take more than one bite wing to make sure you have the best interest of it your It is a patient. diagnostic tool. So make yeah. sure that it, it is diagnostic it enough. Do not be shy to ask time. for a retake. It's, and it's also okay. The periapicals. Typically if it doesn't show the, the apex, just go for it, another one. Yeah. Apex, ask for another one. If, if for example, the x-ray is not clear, it's a justifiable reason to ask for another one for a proper diagnosis because the patient is coming for you to diagnose them. Now, back to the bite wings that we take yeah. to locate the problem. Um, it's also our duty to inform the patient of any incidental findings, oh, i.e. Yeah. other cavities and other teeth on that bite wing that are not as deep or may not be the chief complaint for today's appointment, but they also require treatment, right? Oh, so yeah. that's yeah. also another thing. We take the bite wing, we do the testing, we sometimes... Um, focus on the problem, but we do have to inform the patient if there are any other incidental findings that do require treatment. Now, um, at the conclusion of an emergency appointment, regardless of the emergency, um, what, like, what type of discussions do you have with the patients? So every- Not regarding them, like regarding, you know, their dental health in okay. general so, so generally if it's an emergency exam and, and let's just because we do get a lot of i do get a lot of emergencies and generally if it's an emergency exam just like how i told you it's case dependent exams are very dependent to be quite honest i try because sometimes you reach cases that you have to rule out everything to get to a diagnosis, you know, to get to TMJ pain, to get to wisdom teeth pain, you have to rule out everything. So don't shy away from doing any exam that you think can help you. You know, periodontal probing around the wisdom tooth, a lot of the times I find when I probe around a wisdom tooth, the amount of pus that will come out, I will never be able to visibly see it. So you have to refer the patient for an extraction, right? If Because it's continuous and the patient doesn't know where the foul smell is coming from. So the discussion that I would generally have, they get their diagnosis. They know the, all their treatment options. It doesn't matter what form of insurance, no insurance. It doesn't matter what the patient, it, th their financial background is. They have the right to know 
all of their treatment options. So I get a lot of Ontario Works patients. I know what they are covered for, and some of the treatments cannot be covered. But if I see something on an x-ray or in my intraoral exam, for example, if the patient needs a cleaning, I see the calculus. I don't need an x-ray to see it. I have to inform the patient, by the way, you have a lot of calculus and you need to come back for a cleaning if you want your periodontal health to, you know, be in a betterment situation. So there's a lot of the times where the patient will simply come, I have a root canal, yes, but I see one, two, and three, and this is what I recommend. I understand that this is why you're not here today, but you have the right to know. That is, that is. I feel like there's a bill of right for patients, and that is the one thing. You see something, say it. It's okay, even if they don't want to take it, but you said it. You, you've You've done your due diligence on your end. You record it in your notes. You've advised the patient and, and you say it, right? So a lot of the discussions will include their overall, their comprehensive oral health. Um, sometimes I'll find that patients will have missing teeth and I will offer, you know, I will let them know, by the way, you have this missing tooth. You can have a removable denture. You have the option if, you know, I see that the x-ray is viable for a, 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 sorry, a bridge, a dental bridge, a crown, anything that I find in the mouth or the x-ray, I will inform the patient of it. Now, I don't expect, you know, if a patient is coming for an emergency exam and, and they're here for the lower right side, I do the bite wing, the PA. If I personally, how I do it is if I see a very deep cavity on the upper right side, but they're complaining of pain on the lower right, I will also take it for them. I'll obviously ask for permission. I'll take it for them and I will teach them because a lot of the times patients don't know. So it comes down to you notifying them what they have what they may require always offer dental cleanings because hygiene is the most important thing that's how we catch everything so patients don't get worse the, their cavities don't grow so always offer dental cleanings always offer additional treatment in the sense of what they truly need what you see in the mouth what you see in the x-ray so or that's simply how to avoid another emergency i mean if there is something yeah. that's ongoing to avoid yeah, another obviously. emergency Let's yeah. treat it before it's, you know, before it's an emergency. That's one thing. Another way to look at it is sometimes patients come in with pain and there are multiple sources of that pain. And you like multiple teeth that have um, deep cavities that might be contributing to the pain. It, if, you know, for a lack of time, if you cannot address them all at once, right? Um, it would be nice to inform the patient that you have this and this and that. They all could be contributing to the pain. We will start with this, but um, if your pain persists, it could be because there are other teeth that also need treatments. Just so they don't come back and say, oh, you treated the wrong tooth because it has happened before when it, yeah. the patient had multiple, you know, um, grossly carious teeth and we do not have the time to treat all of them all at once, but giving them a heads up helps a lot because giving them a heads up lets them know that we know um, the pain could persist. We're giving them some medications that might help, but they do need to come back for further treatment to completely take the pain away. Yes, that's, yeah, definitely. I think Dr. Ithar, Dr. Sadi has a question. Uh, I think, uh, I'm on my phone. I don't know how to open the chat. I'm so sorry. Uh, Dr. Yes, Ithar, you yes. can unmute yourself and you can ask that, or you can type it in the chat. Yes. Hi. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, Dr. Hi. Rian, for uh, such a nice uh, uh, meeting, Zoom meeting, really. Um, and my question is um, if, um, uh, in case of um, a permanent tooth uh, luxation, mm -hmm. like, uh, um, were the symptoms more like uh, all favorable? Uh, I mean, like uh, call sensitivity. I had a recent patient, and call sensitivity is like within within normal. So it's not uh, it's slightly sensitive, which we take as the baseline right at the beginning. Tenderness and um, not as much. Like uh, all were uh, all the signs were in the favorable. Um, there was some. Light mobility. Um, 
I I did. I know, and I know that there is uh, might be controversy. You didn't mention any antibiotic in this, but I was thinking um, subluxation. Like there is a path of, of, of for bacteria, and I was like, everything is like in the right direction. I was just trying to see to prevent if any chances of. Uh, um, getting infection if everything was in the favor. I, I of course, I, uh, I, I'm bringing the patient back for follow-up. And as you said, like I have said to the patient that there is a chance of this tooth turning gray or like all the uh, uh, sensitivity, uh, let's say the, uh, the uh, good uh, temperature or thermal uh, uh, recording that I had it might change because this is just a baseline, right? And that there is a chance of uh, the tooth being like had to be treated. It might have to be treated by a root canal in the future if anything changes. But I was like, would you would you recommend a root canal at that stage at the beginning where you have? Uh, it's just a subluxation. Right? It's not a. It's not a uh, like subluxation. Or so, anything. Dr. Riam, do you mind if I answer this one very quickly? Yeah, go ahead. Right, all right. So, thank you very much, Dr. Ithar. It's actually these type of questions that it's just meant to educate all of us. Yes. So, as I understood from what you said, you had a patient who had subluxation with a very minor movement, right? There is yes. no systematic signs of fever or chills or anything like that. No. There was only sensitivity. So, your question is that one, can you give immediately antibiotic to prevent infection? Two, would you proceed immediately to root canal? Correct me if I'm wrong. No, it's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, great. So the first answer is no. You don't give antibiotic whatsoever, right? Let's actually remind ourselves is that antibiotic is a tool. It's not something that we do it all the time, right? So whenever we have systematic involvement, and I keep repeating myself, systematic involvement, or if you feel that the patients are immune compromised and you have a potential of a serious infection to develop, then you go ahead. Definitely subluxation is not one of the things that you do, right? If you have, for example, on the other hand, something else, then yes, you probably do. If you have that into alveolar trauma, like bone trauma, like your bone has broken and the patient as well on the top of that is immunocompromised, yeah, then maybe, and it's still controversial, but for a subluxation, you wouldn't even go ahead and think about it. Number two, you, I personally don't think it's a good practice to uh, do a root canal immediately because you really don't know. So if you look into literature, subluxation tend to be favorable, right? So it is the favorable with regards to the two things, favorable with regards to the five years resorption, and uh, it is favorable as well for uh, vitality. So why should you immediately do it? Personally, what I would do is that I would bring the patient in about two weeks and I do some pulpal testing. Think about it. You can always do the root canal. You can always tell the patient, here is my cell number, call me, or I will call you after three days to check on you if you have further pain or if you have further swelling. But again, what Dr. Riam was aiming to is that in order for you to achieve a diagnosis, there is three factors that you should always consider. Number one is history. Number two is examination. And examination is not only the tooth examination, but rather intraoral, extraoral to include, but not limited to the floor of the mouth, the uvula, the soft palate, the lymph nodes, the muscles and mastications, all that stuff. And on the top of that, right? Your specific problem specific area, right? Whether it was your pocket dips, whether it was uh, your mobility, whether it was your percussion, right? And then your special investigations, the cold test, the radiographs, etc., right? So, and then based on that, once you established a diagnosis, then it's your knowledge that will guide you based on evidence-based. So your knowledge will guide you once you have achieved a diagnosis, what to do and how to do it, right? So this is what I personally would do. I don't know, Dr. Sally, if you want to add anything to this. You answered it perfectly well. 
is 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 that is that is do you think that's okay, Dr. Itar? Do do you agree on this? What do you think? Yes, I do. Actually, I was like on 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 initiating the root canal. I had the same uh, the same concept. So yes, I have like I'm monitoring the patient, and I I did say I'm gonna follow up with the patient, and uh, I did inform the patient that if the tooth turned gray, if he had any swelling, or if any of the tooth didn't uh, respond to call tests, or then then we will do the the root canal. Otherwise, um, we'll be monitoring. But and and even for the for the antibiotic, generally, I, yes, I, I go with the, with the same thing that you said. Like if it's not systematic or uh, or if the patient is not immune compromised. But I just had the question. I was like wondering whether whether it is like just since we're talking about it. Uh, what is no, it's a, it's a good thing to ask questions. It's a beautiful thing, actually. This is how we learn. But I just want to remind everybody, advantages, disadvantages, right? Course, Remember, pseudomembranous colitis is actually a very serious, not only, not only developing resistance, not only anaphylaxis, but at the same time, pseudomembranous colitis. Remember, pseudomembranous colitis is not only associated with clindamycin, it can be associated with okay. any type of antibiotic, any type of antibiotic. I remember as well that truthfulness said Canada is a multicultural, multi-ethnic community that people, there's a lot of immigrants in our patient space. Mm -hmm. And when they come to Canada previously, they've been exposed to all types of antibiotics. I know for a fact, if you live in Kuwait, you can just walk into the pharmacy and buy antibiotics. You don't need a prescription for it. I'm sure probably it's the same in Syria, in Egypt, in Iraq, whatever. I don't know. But mm -hmm. the truth, or India, whatever, it, it, it's the same. It's always the same. And remember, this means been years and years of abuse to the um, GI flora. And remember, it just needs that trigger, right? It needs that trigger. And then the patients will develop uh, pseudomembrane colitis. And believe me, it's not fun. It's not fun. Mm -hmm. And remember, there is a reported again, there is a reported of death with pseudomembranous colitis. There is actually a report. Of, actually, there is a percentage of death of mortality with that. I'm not really following it up very well, but I think it's about 8%. So that's actually it's very serious. So you should do it really mm -hmm. cautiously, right? Still, antibiotic is a tool. Don't, don't be shy to use it if you really need to use it. It's okay. But use it in the proper way, right? Use it in the proper way. A subluxation, unfortunately, is not a defendable situation if your patient develops pseudomembranous colitis. Let's just assume a hypothetical situation. Mm -hmm. The patient presented to you, have a subluxation, you give him antibiotic, the patient developed up a pseudomembranous colitis, went to the hospital and died, right? I probably, if it asked me, and I was an expert uh, opinion person, I would cause that, I would call that as battery and as, um, and involuntary demand slaughter, I would actually call it that way because there is nothing indicating that you should give antibiotic. You gave antibiotic, that means one of the two things, you're either incompetent because you didn't know what to do versus you did it intentionally. So, you know, if you think about it from this perspective, people would look at it this way, right? So I personally would uh, go step aside in a way. And then after that, uh, you know, yes, remind remind myself of what are the indications of of giving antibiotic. As a matter of fact, there is a good exercise since that you've done. This is a very important topic, by the way, the antibiotic, Dr. Sally. It's a very important topic. So what you can do is that maybe that could be the topic of, and thank you, Dr. Ithar, <laughs> for bringing this. No problem. So, right? So why don't we make our next topic of conversation, antibiotic in the dental practice, 